Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Farnborough International Air Show at this historic airfield some 30 miles southwest of London, one of the world's most important gatherings of defense leaders, military officials, industry executives, and aircraft from all around the world on this, the centenary anniversary of the birth of the Royal Air Force, the world's first independent air force. Our coverage here is sponsored by Farnborough International and Leonardo DRS. And it's our absolute honor to be talking to the first Sea Lord, uh, the Chief of the Royal Navy, Admiral Sir Philip Jones. Sir, great seeing you again. I, I remember our conversation two years ago, and uh, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure, Vago. Good to be with you again. Um, it, it's great. A very exciting time. Uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, now is uh, underway. Uh, she is going to be going to the United States, uh, I think, uh, departing Portsmouth in August, uh, heading over for about three months, which is a pretty significant deployment, uh, where she's going to be working with uh, U.S. forces. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what you want to accomplish, uh, you know, from this extended deployment. Uh, you're right. When we spoke two years ago uh, at Fairford, um, during my early months as First Sea Lord, I was keenly aware I was coming into post at a time of great challenge and opportunity in the carrier strike space. And at that stage, Queen Elizabeth was still building in Ross Scythe, uh, and it's been my great honor and privilege during my time as First Sea Lord to uh, bring her away from her build yard, see her commissioned into service in the Royal Navy, and now start the very significant journey towards full operational capability. And that takes a big step up this autumn when she crosses the Atlantic uh, and for the first time starts to embark F-35 jets. Uh, and that will help dispel some of the myths that have been around why do you have a carrier without jets? Well, I think we've always been keen to stress you've got to get the ship right first. We've got to make sure she's working effectively, fully integrated uh, in every way, ready to receive the first jets. And I couldn't be more pleased that it's happening off the eastern seaboard of the United States and that the jets that embark will be from the Integrated Test Force, which is a UK-US combination of uh, test pilots and uh, test and evaluation jets because it has been in collaboration with the United States um, and a very welcome and much appreciated collaboration that we brought this capability into service. Um, how is the, uh, I'm going to get to the a little bit uh, more detail in terms of the exercising. How's the ship performing? You said about getting it right. So far, sea trials have been extremely successful uh, from everything we hear, but you're the boss. You're the one who at the end of the day has to be uh, happy, and if not, how things get fixed. How's the ship performing? Well, she's exactly in the place we would wish her to be at this stage in her journey to operational capability. As, uh, as her captain, Jerry Kidd, reminded everyone who watched those brilliant television programs about her um, earlier in the year, she's a prototype ship. Uh, and if she was a, an iPhone or a car, she would never achieve operational service. But in a class of two, we don't have that luxury. So we have to use the prototype to learn the lessons about build, to learn the lessons about commissioning and bringing her into service, and then use her operationally. So, of course, there have been some bumps on the way. We've learned lessons about propulsion. We've learned lessons about sustainability. Uh, and we're learning lessons about the kind of crew size she needs and, and the cost uh, and, and opportunities of operating her at sea for long periods. But she's through much of that now. She's um, sustainable. Uh, she's in a very sound engineering state, and she's ready to start flying trials, and I'm really pleased with that. Um, and you're obviously feeding some of these lessons into the design of, um, and construction of Prince of Wales. We are. Um, one of the great things about the Aircraft Carrier Alliance that has come together uniting the Ministry of Defence with TALIS, with BA Systems, uh, to build these ships is we're learning lessons from one ship into the other. And Prince of Wales is already being built in a more cost-effective and rapid way than Queen Elizabeth. Uh, and when she goes to sea and starts her trials process next summer, summer 19, I'm confident that she'll do so uh, in a more rapid and effective way even than Queen Elizabeth, which is great news. Um, one of the things uh, that was always discussed, right, the first deployment uh, or, or IOC uh, initial operating capability for the F-35 in the UK is going to be 2021. Um, there's been discussion uh, about marine aircraft or a composite wing going on deployment before that all British wing goes on the ship. How much of the exercises you're going to be doing now are going to be paving the way for that eventuality? And talk to us about little of the conversations you've had with Commandant Neller and Stick Rudder, uh, the Marine Corps Aviation Chief, to prepare for that extended big deck deployment. That's been a hugely important part of our preparation for operations. Um, one of the really important and valuable things we did with Queen Elizabeth during her sea trials last summer uh, was to put her in company with the, uh, the USS George H.W. Bush for a couple of days. The Bush um, 
very helpfully taking part in an exercise enabling our carrier strike group staff to work up on board the bush and understand what it means to task a large air wing and a large carrier strike group and we're very grateful to the bush strike group for enabling that but it it helped us see what it is we're trying to generate here the sophistication and complexity of a u.s carrier strike group and we have to be in that space by the time we deploy our UK carry strike group in 2021. So to get to that point, um, beyond the initial flying trials this autumn, uh, we will move up towards um, a full carrier strike operational workup in UK waters in 2020. And we, the Royal Navy, have got to be ready to uh, sustain, man, and have that strike group ready to, for that workup. And that workup will include a full air wing. And the powerful and very necessary contribution the US Marine Corps have made to that is to make their squadron of F-35s available for us to use during that workup year such that when the mixed UK-US air wing deploys in 21 they are experienced with each other and they're operationally ready to work alongside each other and I'm very grateful to the US Marine Corps for doing that. Um, are you going to, uh, there's a big debate about how many jets the UK is going to get. I know the official number is 138. Uh, there are some folks who think it'll stop at 48. Uh, there are some who think it'll stop at 78. How many jets do you need uh, in that force to ensure that you can deploy both of those carriers simultaneously, which is what the plan is? Well, the line is, is very clear. Um, 48 are on order at the moment, and we're still building up towards that. We're, we're less than a third of the way through that buy. Uh, we're tracking very carefully alongside the Royal Air Force the, the build-up of that capability. And 138 is quite rightly the figure we are driving at. Um, I'm very clear that to have a fully sustainable UK carrier strike capability available continually at high readiness for the government to use, um, we need to have the right number of jets in place and therefore the build up beyond F-48, beyond 48 is, uh, is hugely important. Um, you uh, and the Chief of Naval Operations, John Richardson, uh, are in a very, very close dialogue uh, at, a power of, uh, at a time of the return of great power competition. Um, and a very contested potential war at sea. Um, as, as you look at the space, as you look at the threats, um, the Royal Navy is a global force. Um, both you and the CNO have been working with foreign navies, including striking an, an extraordinary tripartite agreement with the Japanese uh, Navy about future operations. As you look at what future war at sea looks like, what does it look like? What are the capabilities you need to uh, develop uh, and the training you need to institute uh, and the preparations you have to make to be ready in case a conflict breaks out that's, you know, people tend to forget that, you know, you may lose 5,000 people over 15 or 18 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, but in a naval engagement, you'll lose that in an hour. That's very true. Um, and you're right to say that um, the link between the Royal Navy and the United States Navy is as strong as it's ever been. Um, and I'm pleased and honored to have a relationship with the current U.S. Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Richardson, that is as close, if not closer, to any that my predecessors have enjoyed with his predecessors. He and I think instinctively alike about the state our navies are in at the moment, um, the challenges for the future, and the opportunities to rise to those challenges together. Now, of course, the U.S. Navy does this on a scale that no one can match, and yet, we have many compatible capabilities with them uh, and I'm honoured and delighted to see them working closely with us to help us bring those capabilities into service. Yes, of course, it pivots around carrier strike and the F-35, uh, but it also relates to our collaboration on deterrent submarines uh, and also to the way in which we use the doctrine and the concept of sea power uh, to achieve what we need in the future. Admiral Richardson talks a lot about the need for higher readiness, uh, greater resilience, and improved lethality, and those are exactly the priorities that I would apply to what the Royal Navy needs to take its place alongside the United States Navy. And further, as you rightly say, we're not trying to do this just as two navies. Yes, we're both powerfully part of NATO. Um, I'd like to think we're the two navies that um, set the weather for NATO, if you will, um, and look to lead NATO thinking and NATO operations. 
But we also have powerful alliances with other third-party navies as well, some within NATO, with the French. We have a very powerful trilateral relationship. But also, as you mentioned, the relationship with the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force. Now, that has been a groundbreaking piece of work from my perspective, which has opened up the perspective of all three navies to the fact that partnerships can exist in a global dimension. Um, it keeps us focused on how the UK can best be supported by its Royal Navy right across the world, not just in waters close to the UK. And I think it shows the significance of um, the United States links with navies like the Royal Navy and the Japanese, uh, irrespective of where they are in the world, but where they have similar threats um, and similar opportunities to rise to those threats. Um, as you look, though, at War at Sea, um, adversaries are de de developing systems which have mass at range with precision, which is kind of game-changing. Um, as the First Sea Lord, what does that environment look like, and are you confident that the force, whether on training or even the mental preparation required for it, I mean, it, the last time you know anybody traded steel really in a significant way was during the Falkland Islands, which was your experience, but that was in 1982. Um, and it's been a few years since then, and certainly this debate happens in U.S. Navy circles where the U.S. Navy hasn't done it really since World War II uh, in, in certain respects. Talk to us about the preparation, what, what that space will look like, likely, um, the preparations, and including the mental preparations you're doing in your force to sort of transition from uh, a long era of fairly uncontested operations to something that could get very sharp very quickly and, and very harrowing very quickly, potentially. That has been a huge area of change for us, and one we're still in the process of driving through. So you're right to say uh, much of it is driven by range. Uh, we've got to be able to operate the Royal Navy in every ocean of the world, as we are doing this year. Uh, we've got to be able to do so with precision, and I'd add lethality to that. So we have to have genuine capability deployed into those spaces. Um, and while we can't always provide mass ourselves as a Navy, um, enough mass to provide credible presence, yes, but then the readiness to integrate into a wider coalition. Uh, and that, I think, is the key part of our link both to the U.S. Navy and to other navies too, is to have done the hard yards beforehand of training and conceptual integration such that we're ready to work together to respond to those challenges. Now, well, you bring all that together, and, and that's a very tough demand on a Navy, the size and scope of the Royal Navy at the moment. Um, but I like challenges like that. That means um, I have to push the Royal Navy hard to be in a position to work alongside its partners and to respond to the opportunities the government gives us to engage in protecting our interests um, and driving our prosperity aboard. Um, do you, um, but in terms of uh, the kind of systems, for example, China is Ru and Russia are developing to put a lot of steel at you, are you comfortable in terms of the programs and the systems and the thinking you have in place for that sort of future threat, given that your deterrent capability, it, you know, your ability to counter that is what may make the difference between conflict or avoiding it? Uh, yes, I am, because uh, I know that opportunities like the modernizing defense program are very highly threat-focused. Uh, they are very determined to give us the chance alongside our sister services in the UK to transform and modernize into the kind of capabilities that will respond to those threats in the future. Uh, and I know many people look at the kind of capabilities, both state-on-state state and also non-state actor, owned uh, that can contest sea control uh, and can drive some navies like the Royal Navy into perhaps not being able to operate safely and securely in areas where they have done before. And yet I also note that many of those nations are also generating the kind of capabilities that we are because they recognize the timeless opportunity of things like carrier strike groups, um, high-end air defense destroyers and anti-submarine warfare frigates to achieve effect to, if you will, fight their way in um, against an anti-access area denial threat alongside allies. So we're focused on the ability that um, we have to be able to do some of this if that's the national interest for us to do so and not just stay in a safe space. We are ultimately a fighting service that is ready to go into harm's way. My job is to make sure the Royal Navy uh, is trained, sustained, and equipped adequately to be able to do that. And through the modernizing defense program, I feel able to make those points such that we can do so. 
Um, I'm going to get to modernization in a second, but let me ask one parenthetic question because it jumped into my head. Uh, the Russian submarine threat. Um, Royal Navy uh, has had an exceptional submarine force throughout its history. Um, you're now going increasingly under the ice uh, in terms of operations. Um, Talk to us a little bit about the preparations, especially on the anti-submarine warfare part. I know the Type 26, congratulations, by the way, on the Australia uh, decision to select the Type 26, which um, uh, I know your predecessor was very proud of talking about it as the world's best ASW ship. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how you're gearing up, improving uh, your game on anti-submarine warfare, which has been a historical specialty of the Royal Navy. Uh, you're right, it has, uh, and it's always been a key focus for the Royal Navy. Uh, what we've had to preserve uh, through some decades were maritime capability in the round and anti-submarine warfare capability in particular has not been at the forefront of defence thinking is to make sure we're able to respond when the need uh, arises and when the, when the threat goes up. Uh, and we've kept that focus in the Royal Navy, we've kept research and development, we've kept uh, new capabilities in place to do that. And therefore, I'm delighted to see that as part of the modernizing defense program, anti-submarine warfare capability is right back center stage again. And it's not me that's putting it there. It's a recognition across defense, across government, that this is important. Because the resurgent Russian threat um, is right on our doorstep, we don't uh, have an opportunity whether to engage or not in this. It, it is right on our doorstep. Uh, and so I'm pleased to see what we in the Navy call the all-arms anti-submarine warfare battle is being properly thought through. The return to having maritime patrol aircraft um, is hugely significant as a part of this. Um, having very modern Merlin Mark II anti-submarine warfare helicopters that are, if you like, maritime patrol helicopters in their sophistication and ability to counter the threat. We're in the middle of transitioning our SSN force from Trafalgar class to Astute class. That always brings challenges of availability as you keep old submarines running and bring new submarines in. Um, but we are holding the line through that transition. Uh, I've got enough uh, highly trained and skilled crews to man all of those submarines at the moment. And when we have transitioned to a fully fledged astute class force, we will have a world best force of SSNs and they are needed right now. We are bringing them into the North Atlantic ASW battle in ever-increasing numbers. And of course, the Type 26 will be a pivotal part of that ASW battle, and I'm pleased to see it is now getting the recognition across the world that it is absolutely in that state of being the best in breed. And the Australian decision is, I think, a powerful vindication of our choice and all that that's, that will bring. Um, and I'm optimistic that other navies, other nations will recognize that too. That will enable us not only to see more BA systems, world-class shipbuilding capability deployed around the world, but it will enable us to drive up interoperability in the anti-submarine warfare space, and we're already looking with our Australian counterparts as to how we will do that. So it's a very significant challenge. Um, it's one that needs us to have all our capabilities integrated in a way we always have done in the Royal Navy, and I'm pleased it's now sitting so front and center in our modernizing defense program. Um, you. Um but as you said earlier, um, you're up to the challenge of having a small navy but having at the highest end of capability deployed around the world. Uh, but at the same time, again, it's an extremely ambitious modernization agenda. The Dreadnought class, by the way, congratulations, beautiful name uh, to bring back to uh, a great name being brought back into service. Um, the Type 26s, the Type 31s, uh, you still have a carrier in construction. Uh, you have an op tempo which is uh, astounding to many people that, that uh, you know, I, I would always ask uh, Sir George whether or not there was some sort of time machine because anywhere in the world I would go there was always a Type 23 and I knew that's a relatively limited force but they were out and forward all the time. Um, talk to us about the trick of doing this without breaking the force ultimately uh, because what that does is you're slipping maintenance cycles occasionally in order to have those ships out, and then when they go out, they go down hard sometimes. Talk to us about the trick of maintaining this without letting your ambition and the national ambition to break that force. That's a very fair point, uh, and I've been focused on this for a long time now. I had the great privilege of being the Royal Navy's fleet commander for three and a half years, becoming first sea lord, and, and so I had this um, right uh, in, my, in the forefront of my thinking on a daily basis and saw it close up. Uh, we have a, an expectation in the Royal Navy of a level of G2 
generated force which we can use in tasks around the world, perhaps higher than anyone else's navy. Um, and I say that with a degree of pride, but also with a degree of self-caution, uh, that you have to watch that you don't overpromise and underdeliver. Now, coming off the back of um, some choices that both the Navy and Defence made in the last 10 years to take some money out of sustainability, um, to, uh, to underfund some of the support periods and, and the spares resilience of our ships, and we felt we had to do that to prioritise spend elsewhere. We have, over the last five years, been reaping some of the whirlwind of that. Um, ships are late, out of upkeep. Uh, they are going into operational sea training uh, without the spares resilience that we would ideally like. Um, I think we've recognised that now, and alongside other areas of defence, we've realised you can't shortchange sustainability. So I've added into my list of priorities for 2018 alongside the ability uh, to deploy a carrier strike group in 2021 and all we have to do in readiness for that which I've touched on already um, alongside the ability to sustain continuous at sea deterrence and the anti-submarine capability that underpins it I've added resilience now that has a people component uh, alongside our sister services we have to keep working hard at recruitment and retention and we are but it has an equipment capability component to that resilience as well and we have um, reallocated on a prioritised basis funding towards this. Uh, we are seeing green shoots here uh, in the sustainability of the Astute and Trafalgar class SSN force and the Type 45 destroyer force, and that's welcome. But we've got more to do here, and this is a key piece of our collaboration with defence industry. Um, those with whom we have contracts to sustain the SSNs and the Type 45s are absolutely with us in this space. We have to improve the availability, we have to improve the sustainability um, such that we have the resilience to, to be as widely deployed and as heavily used as we are at the moment. Um, I'm happy we're moving in the right direction, I'm happy everyone in the Navy gets my prioritisation here, but it'll take us a little while to, um, to be able to do everything we need to in this space. Um, you've been most generous. I want to hit two quick questions before uh, I, well, we go. Um, first question, we have a strategic defense and security review that's going to get started next year. There are folks who are already using the 750 million pound efficiencies number. I'm not asking you to comment on that. But when it comes to efficiencies, how much more efficiencies can you eke out of this force, given that that, you know, it's said that the more efficiencies you eke, the more you're going to have for modernization. Type 31 is very, very high on the sheet in terms of that affordable 250 million pound ship that's actually going to presage the entry of the Type 26 into service. Uh, talk to us a little bit as you're going into this process. Um, how, what's your thinking? What is your prioritization to make sure that you come out of this review? Granted, you know, defense spending in the UK is 2% of GDP, but your internal costs continue to grow, so it's, it's, you know, which is why Gavin Williamson is, is pushing for more money for the force. Talk to us a little bit about the, the complex dynamics as you go into this to ensure that you emerge from this with the kind of capabilities you need. I think there are two components to this. The first one is, um, in order to try and make sure it's spending money in the right place, the Royal Navy uh, has been looking hard at the efficiency challenge for a, for a long time now. Um, I'm confident that we have leaned out our structures, our processes, our headquarters, our methods of generating the force um, to pretty much the maximum degree we can. Um, and yet, alongside my fellow service chiefs, I fully recognize that we have to look further across defense at what are the key areas where we can do things more efficiently and more effectively such that we can free up money for this transformation um, and for the acquisition of new, more modern capabilities. So the Royal Navy is leaning four square into the efficiency components of the modernizing defense program. And I'm pleased that the way this is being conducted from uh, the Ministry of Defense is to do it top down, not, not just leave each of the services to come up with lots of little ways that we can save small amounts of money, but come in from the top and have a, 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 num um, but a fairly small number of very big programs that we can drive greater efficiency across the whole of defense, and the Royal Navy um, is right at the heart of that. So I believe we're already pretty lean, pretty efficient, um, hardened into force generating as effectively as we can, uh, but we're absolutely in the mix alongside our fellow services to find more effective ways still of spending money the right way. Um, the Defense Secretary uh, is talking about more money and making the case to the Prime Minister for more money. Um, as the Chief of the Royal Navy, are you too small? Do you need to be bigger? 
Do you need to have greater investment in spares as well as weapons to fill up those magazines? Um, given that, you know, folks tend to forget that in a war at sea, I mean, during the Falkland Islands, for example, 20% of the force, I may be getting my math slightly wrong here, but of those 80 ships, six were sunk, a number were damaged. So as you look at it on a percentage basis, just like we were surprised in Iraq and Afghanistan, that equipment gets chewed up at fantastic rates. Um, if you were making the case to him, uh, and if there was going to be more money spent, you know, what's the case? Do you need a bigger Royal Navy to do the things that the nation wants it to do at the end of the day and to make sure that it has the resources, that it has those weapons and spares that will be expended at ferocious quantities, as, as you saw in the Falklands, as we saw in World War II, and in any high-intensity engagement? Um, I, I'm very comfortable with my relationship with my Defence Secretary. He is a passionate believer in defence capability, um, in particular maritime capability. Uh, and he is pushing me hard all the time to get the best out of the Royal Navy and have as much of it as possible uh, deployed on operations. And, and I welcome that challenge. He too recognises um, that to do as much of that as he would wish, to have us deployed in all the places he would wish us to be, um, we need greater resilience in our ability to deploy more ships. Uh, we need different models of how we can sustain a greater presence further abroad. Uh, that might need more people, it might need more investment in support to enable us to do that. And ultimately, a larger number of platforms enables us to be in more places at the same time. No matter how capable your ship, it can only be in one place at the same time. So I think he would absolutely love to see a larger surface fleet such that we can deploy it in more places in a more sustainable way. But we have to do that in a way that's cognizant of the wider resource challenge that the department faces um, and look for opportunities to exploit the rich potential that we think will exist in our new frigate classes, the Type 26 ASW frigate, the Type 31 general purpose frigate, and look to gain more mass that way through more efficient methods of procurement, which is exactly what the National Shipbuilding Strategy is all about, so we can get greater mass for the same price deliver more effect in more places of the world in a more efficient way. And I love him giving me that challenge, and, and the Royal Navy is ready to respond to it. Um, and uh, you a almost answered Type 31, but are you satisfied? Are you there in terms of your vision for what Type 31 will be, basically? Type 31 is uh, a pathfinder program of the National Shipbuilding Strategy, and it's a great opportunity to reset the way in which we do capability. Uh, and the way in which we procure capability, um, getting industry to do more of the hard work uh, up front to look across the market at what available capabilities are there for the price we want to pay, um, and then trying to inject more pace and grip into the way in which that procurement happens. Now, we're still at an early stage. We're in a competitive design phase. Uh, we haven't yet committed uh, to the moment at which we will give a contractor um, the, the, the uh, build money uh, in order to bring Type 31 in. But um, as I have the privilege of chairing the client board within the National Shipbuilding Strategy, I'm looking across a 30-year master plan of shipbuilding, of which Type 31 is at the front end. And the key thing is it is the right way to reset procurement. It's the right way to engage with industry and a greater sense of partnership and, and to make sure we're spending money in the right way. So this work we're doing early on in Type 31 to get that procurement strategy right before committing to a build is, I think, essential, and I welcome it. Admiral Sir Philip Jones, First Sea Lord of the Royal Navy, sir, thanks very, very much. Very much appreciated. Look forward to seeing you aboard Queen Elizabeth over in U.S. waters. It's been a pleasure, Vega, and I look forward to that also. Thank you.